All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, just like to start off very quickly by saying, now that we've all seated, I'd like anyone who's never made a GST mistake or had a Baz error to stand up. So good. I've, my first job as a chairperson was to actually make sure I've got the audience uh, or the um, uh, the audience tuned into what we're going to be talking about. So everyone's felt the grief of a tax error and a BAS adjustment, which is good. So um, thank you. Look, my name's Chris Plakius. I'm Head of Indirect Taxes at Westpac. Uh, before that, I implemented GST at St George with the help of a lot of other people. Um, but I've been doing GST in the banking industry um, since it began, and prior to that, uh, worked in a professional services firm um, in audit as well as in tax. So I've been surrounded by operational risk all my life, I feel, um, and hopefully today we'll get some strong messages. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, I should also just take the opportunity to welcome the people who have joined us through the web, as well as all the familiar faces and some faces I'm seeing for the first time here, so thanks for, for joining us. I'd also like to thank Tony Katsagarikas for inviting me along to, to act as chairperson. Um, it's my first time I've done it for CCH, so hopefully I'll be invited back at the end of it. This afternoon, we'll be looking at managing GST operational risk. We're going to cover it from a number of perspectives. Um, our panel is an eclectic, eclectic bunch. We have Andrew Cavanaugh, who's sitting third, from EY and Mark Taft, who's a partner here in Sydney from EY. They're going to take us through a practitioner's view of current practices and also what the future trends are. Uh, following that, we've got Jared McCartney, who's an executive director at the tax office. Um, Jared's going to talk to us about what I see as a, a tilt and a shift in the compliance strategy of the tax office um, to what's known as a self-assurance model. Uh, I'm colloquially referring it to as a taxpayer-led self-assurance model, um, but Jared's going to inform us more about what direction the tax office is taking on that front. Finally, Tony Katsagarikas on the end is going to look at how um, CCH and the technology tools that are available to us as, as people who deal with GST and indirect taxes what tools are available for us to use to make our lives easier so that the next time we're sitting here and I say who hasn't made a mistake or who has, uh, we can all stand up and say we got it all right. So hopefully at the end of today um, we're a bit wiser uh, on managing GST operational risk. So without further ado, I'd like to begin by inviting Andrew Cavanaugh and Mark Taft. I think Mark's going first. Thank you. If you have questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, I'm sure the presenters are happy to take them at the time they're presenting or at the end of each presentation. And I also encourage those who are watching us and listening to us on the web to send your questions through and we're moderating them and I'll be taking them here at the front. Thanks, guys. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Managing GST operational risk. Um, I might just go back a little bit on my history. I've been in indirect taxes pretty much all of my working professional life, starting with sales tax. Uh, so I was here right from the beginning on GST, like, like Chris. And if I reflect back on implementation, um, I vividly remember discussions with uh, clients during that period uh, with the IT function and trying to explain how GST worked to them. And, and one guy getting quite frustrated with me and saying, look, Mark, I need to translate this new law into what a system will do. He said, I'm a system guy. I understand yes, I understand no, I understand if. Now, if you can't translate what you're telling me into yes, no, and if, then we have to come back tomorrow. Um, so I started to get a bit of an education on the systemic side of GST, and GST obviously is incredibly reliant on that because we don't run, as everyone in the room knows, we don't run off uh, profit and loss statements, we don't run off the balance sheet, 
We run off lookup tables in, in the main anyway, in ERP systems with a bit of help from Excel spreadsheets and a bit of flying by the seat of our pants. So when we were asked the question about, well, what's, what's the current status on managing operational risk? Uh, as it happens, it was a quite timely question because we'd only just finished doing a quite major survey of Ernst & Young of well over a hundred of our, of our uh, large corporate market and asking various questions about managing tax, of which there were quite a number specifically focused on GST, and Andrew will take you through the answers to that. So we can say, in a percentage sense, exactly what a sizeable chunk of, a, of the large market is doing in terms of handling that risk. Um, the, the broader context of the discussion though, and I think it's particularly relevant in Australia, is that we're in a quite unique market. And I can say that because I, I went to the EY Global Conference in Rome on indirect taxes in April. And this is the only jurisdiction in the world where you have the combination of a revenue authority that has identified that its number one risk in indirect taxes <coughs> is integrity of business systems and has quantified that risk uh, and then also related it to what it calls the tax gap and I'm not sure whether you've got tax gap slides in there but um, that's about the, the total amount of possible tax that you would expect to get out of an economy versus what you're actually getting and, and how much of that you're getting with effort from the tax office as opposed to with no effort. So our tax office has done all of that and has a number in mind as to how much effort it is having to exert to get something like 5% of the revenue. We have that. We also have not one, not two, but three different external vendors of um, software aimed at compliance in the GST space, um, of which... Um, well, really, two have, have been entrants into that market within the last two to three years. There's no other market where that's yet happened. Um, up until that point, it had tended to be one product and sold largely around the world. Um, those products are aimed at the cheaper end of the spectrum. The alternative is the upfront end, the what's called determination, and they're much more expensive, but and typically prompted by either major, major system upgrade, global control or, or a global collapse, but these things are much more affordable. Um, so put all those things together and what you had was a, a market that is kind of ripe for people to explore more what could be done. And, I, and then the other thing that's happened in this market that's unique is that in Australia we have for the first time in over 100 years an external an externally appointed Commissioner of Taxation who brings to the table uh, a wildly different way of looking at, at the way taxes should be run and the efficiencies of the ATO. Part of, the, uh, of this presentation is very much about what Jared's saying and where the tax office is headed next uh, and what the functionalities are that are out there for people to explore and where you go from there. So a somewhat uh, lengthy introduction to a relatively simple task for me. So in terms of existing operational risks, I'd just put them into three broad, broad categories. IT and systemic stuff, you know, yes, no, if, how does it translate into system? Does it work? Do we get all the way from data entry through to BAS lodgement without it falling in a hole somewhere in the middleware or uh, forgetting some other system setting switch or did we get all the entities? Have we got the right lookup tables? Uh, did we understand the tax condition sets? Did the IT department give us anything in the way of analytic capacity? That's that element of it. The qualitative and process side, I would, I would suggest the Australian market is is strong. You know, relative to most jurisdictions, we've had a very active tax office in terms of the body of ruling. 
Rawlings. We've had a very active um, profession in terms of exploring issues and we've had a very active taxpayer function that gets on top of what the right technical answer might be. Uh, how that translates into system, that's a slightly different question and much harder one to answer, but I don't think we've been lightweight on, on qualitative and process side of things. And the other major category I'd put down is transactional, and of course GST is very much an adversarial tax. Um, the, the founding fathers, if you like, didn't go out of their way to make it easy for taxpayers in Australia because they said, well, whatever price it is you're extracting from your customer, it's inclusive of GST. So if you want to get GST on top of that, you're going to have to do that contractually uh, via uh, GST gross-up clauses. And, and so there's quite a active, vibrant you know, approach come market out of all the legal functions of corporates and the big four, no matter what the deal is or, or what the products are, to make sure that that capacity to increase price for GST is dealt with. And that manifests everywhere from assigning codes to uh, SKUs through to deciding do I charge tax or not on this sale of a going concern. So three board categories, quite different skill sets, how they mesh uh, can often be the challenge, but it's not, it's not for lack of not for lack of focus, um, I think it's in a sense been for lack of uh, readily available tools that you can warm to, get your head around and implement. We, we certainly didn't have them in Australia in, in 2000 as compared to what we've got now. Um, if I look at, say, the jurisdictions that are moving into GST, take Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia is a brilliant example in the sense that the, the Revenue Authority has issued a document saying these are the kind of system requirements uh, that we would like to see you meet. We'd like to see you off into the future be able to produce data in this format. It's like the longest search query you've ever seen. Uh, we didn't have anything like that in 2000 in Australia. So, uh, If I look at how we've managed stuff over the years to now, um, this is quite a lengthy list and in a sense a journey and a journey that was really waiting for better, cheaper ability to extract and analyse data and everywhere you go now you hear big data and that's because uh, right across the board in corporates the capacity to extract it and analyse it has become cheaper. Um, so what, what we were doing in a sense was trying to get to that degree of certainty but without that capacity. Uh, so we came up with things like advance agreements, which were really a laborious exercise of us in the tax office trying to convince ourselves that the whole thing was being managed well enough to take your eye off it. Uh, we had little decision trees on laminated paper for the accounts payable people to use or not use. Um, but we didn't really have the capacity to test that particularly well because the only real methods of testing that at the time were things like statistical sampling, which in a GST sense are not, they're not fine-tuned enough. Uh, confidence intervals mean that your error rate might, you're only 95% confident the true error lies between here and here, and between here and here might mean I lose my job versus I have no problem at all. So they weren't especially good, although they were quite helpful if you did happen to get the right answer. I was always happy to stick it in front of the tax office. Risk control matrices, which is really almost the same sorts of stuff as, as the Sarbanes-Oxley types of exercises. Sarbanes-Oxley was done, but I never found it enormously convincing in a GST sense. Often I'd maybe see four or five boxes, and that was about it. Knowing full well the environment's much more difficult than that. Uh, there were some quite useful things, things like re reconciling bases to financial statements. Um, you know, add up 12 bases, compare it to a P&L, extract things that you wouldn't see on a BAS, like, like depreciation, amortisation, and you could kind of get somewhere near. At least from a due diligence perspective, you could get to somewhere that told you something, which was quite good in the sense of that transactional category I was talking about. It was quick. It was quick and dirty, I guess, but it was better than nothing. Uh, 
and then you had, I've put CAV there. I mean, for a long time we used products like IDEA and Discovery looking for missed credits, as did various providers. Um, quite a useful tool, a bit slow from our perspective to get data in. You were sort of starting with a clean sheet of paper all the time. Uh, but it was around. It wasn't really being used as a month-to-month -month exercise before I might lodge a BAS. It was being used as a sort of in arrears exercise. But we did occasionally find quite sizable swings and roundabouts. So you'd have to put it down as something we used to manage operational risk, but it wasn't a be-all and end-all. Uh, and as I say, the whole field is changing incredibly rapidly. The stuff that's around now, I'm sure in five years' time, we'll look at and say, well, that was kind of revolutionary for its time, but, but we've so moved on from there. Um, and even within EY, I know I can now access guys with data extraction CVs that, that make me feel pretty stupid <laughs> when I'm asking them questions. So, um, Andrew, do you want to talk about this benchmarking and what people are actually doing? Thanks, Mark. I'll just leave it on me. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, uh, a tax benchmarking study that was released in uh, April 2014, and uh, it was a survey of, of 106 large market corporates. So uh, turnovers greater than 100 million dollars, and questions were asked of, of the tax functions. And I think really. Uh, for two reasons. It's, uh, it's an interesting survey. One, it gives tax functions a bit of an idea as to what everyone else is doing in the market, the other tax functions. And secondly, it's showing the direction to which most tax functions are now heading. So useful in those, in those two, for those two reasons. And what, what clearly emerged from the survey was that, that tax functions are aware of a need to, to change here. And that need to change <clears throat> excuse me, is driven by some significant internal drivers such as cost reduction that a lot of tax uh, functions are facing and some fairly significant external pressures as well such as increased ATO audit activity. So if I look at, um, at one of the questions that was, that was uh, asked of respondents in the survey uh, just to understand what internal pressures were being faced by tax functions across the board and if I just focus on the three most significant uh, uh, factors here, and, and you might sort of think of, your, think of it uh, in terms of your own relative position and whether these are pressures that you are feeling as well. Uh, cash flow um, improvement or, or, or ensuring that you've got sufficient cash flow for the, for the business given that the significance significant amounts of, of tax are being paid on a regular basis. That was 53% of respondents felt cash flow pressures. Uh, and 55% uh, cited a need to increase risk management. So not from their, current from, from their current position of risk management, they're feeling the pressure to increase the level of risk management that they're, they're bringing to the table. And by far and away the biggest one was uh, the pressure to reduce costs, particularly um, uh, this response since uh, post the GFC. So there's some of the, the pressures that, that tax functions are, are telling us um, that they're under internally. Uh, externally, uh, the pressures are really coming, I think, predominantly from, from ATO activity, from, from ATO audits. And what this, with what this graph is showing is that, that income tax and GST are not surprisingly the two most significant areas of tax office focus. So what that, that graph is saying is that 48% that of respondents of this 106 uh, corporate group, 48% uh, of respondents experienced a tax office review, a GST risk review or a GST audit within the last three years. And of course all of these audits and all of these risk reviews uh, are fairly time consuming activities and they, they, they consume the budgets uh, fairly rapidly of, of tax functions in responding to these reviews. So they're the, they're the external pressures that are being faced. The next question uh, that I just want to focus on here is, well, you know, in the face of these internal pressures and these external 
um, and external drivers. The question was asked, well, what, where, could, where do tax functions see their improvement coming from? And the response in this, res in this respect was very, very clear. So far and away, the most significant area of improvement that they saw, that tax functions saw uh, in improvement, is the, the improved use of technology and automation. And that was 46.5%. Uh, and, and then the second most significant was process improvement at 26%. And if you kind of bundle those two together, because really when you are putting in new technology, you're actually changing your process, your tax processes. So in effect, we're talking about 73% of respondents are really bundling this, this technology automation process improvement as an area where they see significant improvements uh, in a, an ability to significantly enhance their, their output as a tax function. And I think anecdotally as well, uh, you know, I think in the last six months uh, we're probably seeing more questions and, and, uh, and queries from, from corporates around what is the technology that's available in the GST space that we can use to manage the big data loads that we have that are coming out of our system each and every month? Probably seen more questions in those six months than probably in about the 13 and a half years before it. So there's certainly a big, a big uh, uptick in, in interest in that area. Now this is an interesting question and you can probably have a think about this in terms of your own uh, BAS preparation processes. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through it uh, a little bit in, in detail because it's very, very important. The question that was asked in the survey is, is what level of data analytics is, is currently supporting your BAS preparation processes? So 10% of the respondents, and bear in mind this is greater than $100 million turnover, 10% of respondents said, we run the tax report from the system and we put the number on the BAS. So that's running the report, putting the number on the bus. And I won't get any, I won't do a straw poll here. I heard there were some straw polls in Melbourne Arts. So I won't ask anyone to raise their hand to say, yes, this is how we prepare our bus. But that's 11 of the respondents, or 10% of the respondents. The next biggest group said that we do those things. We run the report, we put the number on the bus, but we also do some trend analysis. We compare this month's figures to last month's figures, or this month to the same period last year, which is interesting from a systemic risk point of view because, of course, if there is a systemic risk in your GST processing, the same problem will be there this month that was there last month and that was there 12 months ago. So you're really not going to be actually able to pick out anything from an operational or process or, or system risk perspective. And then the biggest proportion said, well, we do those things. So we run the report, we put the number on our BAS, we do some trend analysis, but we also do some qualitative testing of large transactions. And that was 50, nearly 55% of respondents uh, did that. And so clearly, I think, if I look around the 100 in this room, that's probably where most, most tax functions sit. And then the, the fourth response was, we do full exception testing across effectively 100% of the data on the granular data using an analytics package on a monthly basis. And that was, was seven respondents out of the 106, or 6.6% 6, 6 .6 of, of, of large corporates said that. Now, just a couple of comments on that number of, of seven, seven out of 106, I think that's important. One is, I, I think at least some corporates find it cost effective and efficient to use analytics on a monthly basis to manage their operational risk. That's the first point. It's, it's clearly uh, some sort of, it, it's cost effective to a, a certain percentage of the, of the population. Um, and whether that be the use of third party software or native ERP systems, difficult as they may be, uh, or even the use of outsourced services there. And the second point I'd probably make is that it's probably something to do with the timing of the survey. Because as Mark mentioned, the use of analytics on a monthly basis and the availability of these tools is a relatively new thing. So these weren't around uh, a couple of years ago, for sure. So um, uh, I think, therefore, it's probably the timing of the, uh, of the survey. And then on top of that is, uh, you know, six months ago, 12 months ago, we didn't have the tax office talking about its self-assurance model either. So, you know, whilst it is only 7 or 7% 7 at the moment, uh, we can certainly see that there will be a significant increase in, in that. So perhaps 
and I'll suggest it's a perhaps part of the reason we see some operational and systemic risks uh, in the market is because there isn't this level of data analytics being performed on a monthly basis. And what I've tried to do is just to sort of summarise or categorise these operational risks into probably six, six categories, and I'll give some concrete examples of things that, uh, that we've seen in the market. Obviously, it's all been sanitised, so you won't hear your, you know, hopefully there'll be, there'll be no references to, to anyone here. But the first type of, of risk uh, that we see is errors in the underlying tax code mapping. So just to give a, an exact concrete example of what I mean here, uh, we looked at a, uh, there was a corporate in the, in the retail sector and it made about 5% of its acquisitions as agent. So 95% as principal, 5% as agent. When an invoice came in for $100 plus $10 GST, there was very robust processes around acquisitions made as agent. And, and sure enough, the AP person hit the button and said, this is an acquisition as agent. But underlying that was some tax code mapping that took that $10 GST and just simply mapped it into the general ledger clearing account, the input tax credit clearing account. So it was given the same tax code as all of the other acquisitions that were made as principal. And of course, it was buried. Like it was, you know, this is 5% of their transactions, so it was deeply buried within the data, very, very difficult to have, have spotted. So errors in the underlying tax code mapping. Secondly, inadequate AP training leading to under or over claims of GST. So to give an example here, there was an entity um, in the infrastructure industry that was making irregular uh, importations of goods. And when there was some data analytics run over the, the, the acquisitions they'd made, there was small percentages of GST being claimed, 2 and 3% GST on acquisitions. When we looked into what those acquisitions actually were, it was the customs broker, customs broker invoice on which they charged GST. That was the 2% GST. But then a big portion of the, of the invoice was in fact the disbursement, which was the import GST paid by the customs broker to the Australian Customs Service. And the accounts payable operators uh, weren't able to, to, to identify that that was actually import GST that could be recovered and there was you know, several, million, uh, several hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of import GST that would otherwise have been missed. Excel formulas, formula errors in BAS preparation. I think, I think we're, everyone has seen an Excel spreadsheet with, with errors in, and, and you know, I could talk examples galore, but I will just mention one where an entity that had nine, a, a, a GST group that had nine entities within, within the group acquired the 10th entity uh, prepared their BAS, but the formula for the uh, the formula that, w that was in the Excel spreadsheet only covered on the input tax credit side the ten entities, but on the output tax side only covered the nine entities. So for a period of months, it was just simply under remitting the GST formula errors in in Excel spreadsheets. Intra group supplies GST intra GST group supplies. This is clearly a big error. Entities within a within a corporate group or even within a GST group, a common, a common area of, of systemic risk. Why? Because it's not usually done by invoicing. It's usually intercompany journals, things that aren't happening, happening through the ordinary documentation procedures. Um, you know, we sometimes see just within a, group, within a GST group, GST being charged, uh, which you know, shouldn't be the case because they're out of scope suppliers, but when they are, the other side's not even effectively claiming it, as, uh, claiming it back as a credit, so there's an overpayment of GST. So it would be very, uh, very important to look at those intra-group intra supplies. Fifth, misreporting of GST-free input tax sales. Now, interestingly enough, we see, sort of generally speaking, there's less emphasis placed by tax functions on these numbers that go into the BAS, much more on the, the, uh, the input tax credits and the output ta tax that's being remitted, but far less uh, generally speaking, on the GST free and the input tax sales. And in one case, there was a, a taxpayer had added an extra digit, a transposition error. So instead of making $2 million worth of GST free sales in the month, it was $20 million. And to the credit of the tax office, Jared, it was picked up. And a question was raised. And then there was a response that needed to be given as to, as to what, what, that, what that spike was all about. And then finally, uh, incorrect hard coding of goods and services as non-taxable. 
GST is, a, is an interesting tax in, in a sense that most of the GST decisions are made by people that sit outside the tax function. So they're made by people within the accounts payable function that are, that are hitting a tax code each and every time an invoice comes in the door. Or that are responsible for the billing system and for a new product that's being, that's being developed and sold, a goods or service, and are assigning themselves the tax code, whether it's taxable or non-taxable. So incorrect hard coding, and of course every time it's been coded as, as non-taxable, every time that invoice is raised, GST is not being remitted. So I'll just pause for a minute now, and just to summarise where, where, we, where we've come from. So Mark spoke about the, the previous methods of managing operational risk, the use of tax decision trees and statistical sampling and so on. I've then mentioned the current state of tax functions and the internal drivers and the external pressures that are being faced and the limited, relatively limited use of data analytics on a monthly basis. And I've talked about some specific um, systemic failures that are, that are typical and, and, and to be you know, watched out for in the, in the marketplace. Now what I'd suggest is that the future state um, of managing operational risk is in the implementation of, of new technology. Um, such as BAS automation software, monthly data analytics as an integral part of your BAS preparation process. The surveyed corporates are pointing to new technology as, as the area that, that, that they want improvement, that they can see improvement in. The tax office is identifying integrity of business systems and the self-assurance model as an area that, 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 is, that is to be developed further with all the incentives um, that can be provided to taxpayers such as exemption, uh, potential exemption from integrity of business system audits um, and so on. So for those tax functions that are uh, moving down this path of, of implementing new technology to manage their operational risks, I'll give some practical tips around, you know, the, qu the key question here is, is how do I get the best out of the software to manage operational risks and drive benefits. So how do I get the best out of the software? And the first thing that needs to be understood here is what are the GST risks that I'm trying to manage and trying, uh, and trying to, to, to sort of have, a, have a good close look over. It might be that I've got margin scheme sales or I'm making GST free exports or it's an, I've got agency or rebates. You know, these are key inherent GST risks in any, in any organisation that has those activities. Because understanding your GST risks drives the next point, which is how do I get the right data fields into the software or into these products to ensure I'm properly managing my risk? So for example, if you've got lots of export sales or export of goods, you'd be looking to say, well, within my ERP system, I might have the ship to field. I'll say that again, just so I don't make it clear. Ship to field within my ERP system. So at least I can get that data field, put it in, drag that into the software and know that the goods that I've, I've sold have actually left the country and that's supporting my GST free treatment. It might be that I'm making lots of acquisitions from smallish entities and I might want to therefore get the ABNs of my, of my vendors to ensure that I'm paying, when I'm paying GST to people, they've got valid ABNs or they're registered for GST. So identify the, max, the data fields to maximise the analytics. And interestingly enough, when it comes to SAP, which is about a third of the market, the standard SAP GST report, in about 50% of occasions, doesn't have the customer or vendor name in it. So the, the, the report that is being used by tax functions, doesn't, you can't actually sue, see who the vendor is or who the customer is from the standard SAP report. So getting that right data in the first place will give considerable uh, benefits in terms of your data analytics. Considering all the flows, all the data flows from the ERP system. So if, the, if, if what you're, you're pulling into the software, if you're, what you're importing into the software doesn't contain all the GST, then clearly you're not going to get the right, the right answer um, out of the software. And your reporting structure is important as well in implementing this technology. Do you want to see uh, a mini BAS for each entity within your GST group? because, for example, you've got management reports that you can reconcile to your mini BAS, or do you want to see a consolidated BAS at the end of the day and you don't really care about the, the, the makeup of, those, uh, of the GSC that goes into that consolidated BAS? 
and a project implementation plan. There's, there's no point implementing that technology and then finding at the end of the day that you really needed three or four extra data fields in in the first place to ensure you get the best out of the analytics. And then you've got the revision, the revision of your current BAS preparation process. And a lot of these steps that you're currently doing that are manual can now be automated. So it's, it's worth, and of course you want to be running the BAS, the current BAS preparation process in parallel with the software that you'll be, you'll be using. So you'll be revisit, revisiting your, your current process. And finally, new procedures documentation. So you, you may implement, you've implemented a new piece of technology, but in effect you've completely changed the way you currently produce the BAS. So you'll need agreed upon procedures signed off by management saying these are the analytic tests that I'll run monthly, these are the tests that I'll run quarterly, and these are the dollar parameters that are important to the organisation that, that need to be reviewed on a, on a, on a very close basis. So, once properly implemented, what will the software tools give you? Well, they'll clearly give a high level of automation. So no longer taking numbers off reports with the risk of transposition error as it goes into an Excel spreadsheet with the risk that the formulas aren't correct when it actually goes into the BAS. So it's a level of automation far in excess of what's available in Excel from the source data to the BAS that's lodged with the tax office. It'll give GST data analytics the ability to run a, a large number of built-in tests across not just the qualitative, not just a small component, but in fact 100% of the transactions. And process standardization and efficiency gains. Okay, so what used to take three days, you can compress down to, to a few hours to do. Uh, process standardization, so if you've got a number of bases being produced for your various entities that have been acquired over time, you can have a, a tax person moving from one to the other to the other um, because they understand the process has been standardised in the, in the automation. And of course valuable insights into what the data is saying and what the system is doing. It's amazing how many times people will tell you that um, no, our system can't charge someone 11% GST. But then of course when you have a look at, at the data you find that there's, there are amounts that are being charged over 10% and, and are being recovered under 10%. Of course, the tools won't answer all the questions. So there are things that need to be done outside the software tools. They won't, ask, they won't answer the question, is all of my GST impacted data going into the BAS? Okay, because it's not, if, if it's not in the data stream to begin with, it's not going to be in the BAS. Uh, they won't answer the question, is all of my, are all of my entities in the data? And these questions are about the completeness of the, of the data and the completeness, therefore, of the BAS that's being lodged. And the tax office will be interested in these questions. Now, how do I know I've got all the entities and how do I know I've got all the data feeds going in there? But of course there are other ways, and Mark mentioned one of those other ways, the, the comparison to P&L. It could be um, taking your cash flow statement, your audited cash flow statement, and looking at the proceeds from, from suppliers to customers within a year, dividing that number by 11, and comparing it to the total of your 1A boxes over the same 12 month period. That will give some comfort that you've got all your entities in and, and all the data flows have gone in. So, in conclusion, uh, it's quite important, it's very important, that tax functions can, can cut through, I guess, the corporate noise and articulate a good business case for the implementation of, of the new technology because that, it is becoming significantly more affordable and it's giving efficiency, process and accuracy improvements. As I mentioned, insights into the AP and AR data, positive assurance, positive assurance over your operational risk. This is not negative assurance that, well, nothing's gone wrong so far, so I think I'm okay. This is actually positive assurance. The tests have been run across all my data and I've not seen, and, and, and the errors can be explained, or the anomalies can be explained. And of course, the ability to satisfy ATO self-assurance models. So that the fact that there's, there's analytics being done on a monthly basis will give those sorts of incentives that I mentioned 
you know, potentially the exemption from, from integrity of business system and the lower risk rating from a GST perspective. And finally, the time to spend on, for tax functions to spend on strategic and more value add activities. So look, I'm not usually prone to make a bet, but I will make a prediction that uh, what we saw was 7% uh, of respondents saying they use analytic data, they use analytics on a monthly basis. My prediction is within about three years, we would expect to see somewhere around 50% to 70% of corporates in the large market using analytics on a monthly basis before the bazers are actually lodged with the tax office. So I should get an invite back in, uh, uh, in about 2017 to see whether that prediction has turned out to be the, the case or not. But that, that's the prediction that, uh, that we see. Thank you. Right, well, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't know about you, Lob, but when I went through and looked at all the list of uh, things that I've done in 15 years, I think I ticked every single one that Mark had on the list. I think every single error that Andrew had on the list I've done as well. So uh, I was getting a bit worried as they were working through their presentation of what else they were going to uncover. But thank you very much for that. I'd like to invite some questions to um, Mark and or Andrew. We've got a couple of minutes. We're running right on time. I think there's a microphone that uh, is available. Does anyone have any questions for Mark or for Andrew? <clears throat> One of the things that struck me when we were preparing all of this was we, we haven't talked much about how helpful IT functions are to tax functions. Um, and. Uh, I don't know what the experience has been in this room, but certainly our experience in talking to clients is that when a tax function asks for a tool or something that might help analyse something, the usual response is, yeah, um, we'll put you on the list. The list, you probably rank about 150 on that list. The internal cost, we'll work that out and it'll probably be you know, a few hundred thousand. You come back the next year and, and find that uh, you're still on the list, but now you're at 180 on the list instead of 170. I'm, I'm curious whether anybody has found IT functions way better than that, or is that really a kind of general view that I, that I could rely on? There's a fair bit of nodding, uh, and I think that's it, it helps explain where we are. It, it explains why there isn't that much analytic work being done because it's not easy to get that uh, out of existing IT functions where you've had a period where there's been huge amounts of ERP implementations or upgrades over that period, but the usual response is, look, we're doing the most basic one we can do. We don't want to spend any more time on tax function than we have to. And it's very difficult for the tax function to know what to ask for and to nail down, hang on, I know you can run that report over there. I know you could make it do all these things for me. Uh, that, that's been, I wouldn't call it a closely guarded secret, but boy, it's, it's tricky to extract that information from implementation partners. On, on Based on, on our experience, we're seeing a yeah. mark shift from people deploying applications internally um, and actually having us host on, on their behalf and one of the primary drivers is often, I don't want to deal with IT because I've got to get prioritised, it's slow, um, we're in the queue, we, we can't get what we want. Um, so where it used to be maybe 10 years ago, you might get 20, 30, 40% coming across to hosting where well over 80% of our clients are now hosted. Um, and now we're seeing some really large clients um, and organisations where traditionally will not even look at hosting, so the banks, the financial institutions, even the big four, looking to outsource the um, outsource some of that capability. Yeah, and it, and it starts at the more global taxes, and mm -hmm. let's face it, GST is just about the most standard global tax, and as a consequence, third-party vendors build to something that is reasonably standard because you've got a global market to build too. Um, but it'll go from there into other stuff. Are there any other questions? All right. Oh, yes. Hi, I was just, just wondering, obviously back in 2000, whenever it was that GST was implemented, um, 
everyone sort of sat down and said, right, you know, how, how are we going to implement this? What do we need to do? Has it been your experience since then that most corporates have, have taken a sort of set and forget? And as long as they haven't had any sort of, um, say, adverse um, results from risk reviews, etc., cetera, um, they've tended to take a more of a reactive approach to GST? Uh, or do you find um, clients are sort of actively sort of looking to say, well, let's have a review. Our business maybe is changing. Are we still doing things properly? Uh, What's your sort of experience mix, from the client's it's perspective? It's a mixed bag. Um, broadly, yes. The skill sets that were around have slowly drifted away and the explanations for how systems were set up probably weren't documented brilliantly at the end of implementation. But where you see differential spurts of work, if you like, is the minute the tax office turns up and says, I'm interested in understanding what you do, that'll prompt a degree of work. Uh, a major acquisition, so due diligences kick off, be it either a vendor due diligence or a purchaser due diligence. Sometimes the fact that you've bought an entity uh, with, with a limited uh, indemnity period, so time's running out, well, you know, if we're ever going to make a claim against the vendor, we better have a bit of a look-see now. Sometimes it's opportunistic. It'll be, well, can you just come in and have a look and maybe we missed some stuff. Um, uh, often it'll be prompted by a new person, a, a CFO comes in who, for instance, has had a bad experience on GST in a different organisation and just approaches it very cautiously. Uh, or, or there is that element of new broom sweeps clean. It, it's like, well, I'm, I'm here. If there's a big problem, finding it in the first six months, that's a tick for me. Finding it two years down the track, it's going to be more my problem. So maybe it would be a good idea to get it looked at now. So you do find all sorts of different reasons for people doing stuff. Uh, but broadly, it, it's not... Those survey results tell a pretty big story that most returns are being lodged almost on a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants basis. It's pretty hard to believe, fundamentally, that it's all okay if that's the amount of testing that's going in. You'd have to be awfully sure that the thing's been set up properly and that all those little AP people are doing all the right things. The only illustration I can think of where I would feel like that would be a full-blown Oracle R12 or, or the like implementation where you can remove the human element altogether. Uh, from scan in through to the creation of tax rules, automate the whole thing and it'll just spit out the far end. But, you know, even that has its uh, concerns when you sign off that it did get implemented correctly because you know you're going to take your eyes off it. Uh, long answer to short question, but the, that's, um, that's the, the spectrum. Yeah, the, the other side as well. And, uh, not wanting to preempt Gerard's presentation, but one of the things that becomes very evident is um, there's a discussion that says in this sector of the economy, nobody's going to make a deliberate mistake. Um, but what the ATO is finding is that mistakes are coming up, and that the, we talk about a confidence gap where a lot of the taxpayers are confident in their systems, which typically tend to be Excel. But when you look at the error rates, their error rates are, are, are pretty high. So that's driving a lot of activity, which is driving a lot of consciousness around the mistakes that are there and people are getting surprised that that level of mistake actually exists. And I think that's also generating a lot of interest and, and refocus on GST. I've got a question from our, our web. Yeah. Isn't the thorn in the side of the tax function the lack of robustness of the GL or other systems GST data? Software will identify these via exceptions, but the poor data still needs to be fixed or the error will recur again. Does anyone want to take that one? If I could say a few words on, on that. I mean, we focused a lot on systems and technology, and one of the things that um, I'll cover a little bit later, but technology is an enabler and it's a tool, um, but it's not the whole solution. It's, it's process, it's data integrity, it's people, it's, it's how it all fits together. And technology certainly is a key component, but it is just a tool enabling. If you don't use it properly and if it's not applied properly and configured properly, 
you're just going to get the wrong result in a different way. I mean, it's a critical component, but it's not the only component. There's a bigger picture around that, and data integrity is certainly one piece of that. It's your processes and everything. Yeah, I think Andrew touched on it when he said, well, the, the third-party products can be aimed, or are aimed, really at your standardised GST reports. But if, if what's in those reports is missing an entity or a division or a transaction type, um, it's garbage in, garbage out. So they, they answer a lot of questions about what is available, but they don't answer the, the totality. And yes, it's a thorn in the side, but it doesn't mean they're not a quantum leap on where you are at the minute. And, and the bits that are missing, I think, are more susceptible to being dealt with via more traditional interrogation or, or data extraction and analytics of a different type. Um, yeah. Thanks, Mark. That's good. Keep the questions coming. Thank you. We'll move on to the second part of our agenda. So I'd like to introduce Jared McCartney from the Australian Tax Office. Uh, Jared's going to talk to us about improving the integrity of our business systems through assurance tools and he's going to cover the uh, self-assurance model. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Chris. Um, look, uh, I'll just give a bit of an introduction of myself too. Um, for almost the last three years I've been the uh, GST Integrity of Business Systems Risk Manager. Uh, before that, I was in um, GST, um, large market compliance, uh, and through that experience, I've seen firsthand how um, many of you have to operate uh, in highly complicated and diverse you know, structures, and uh, where uh, you've got operations all around the country, and uh, there may be uh, use of more than one systems, and um, you've got integration issues, and and you need to operate in an environment where you're lodging a monthly um, BAS by the 21st day of the following month. So uh, uh, I recognise uh, there are a lot of risks which need to be mitigated, mit mitigated to ensure that you're uh, correctly reporting. Um, in my experience, most of the errors that we've seen you know, uh, were of an inadvertent, inadvertent nature, um, basically stuff-ups. Um, human error occurring at manual intervention points. Um, in my current role as the IBS, well, the Integrity of Business Systems Risk Manager, uh, look, I, I need to oversee and then update and improve our risk treatment strategy. And that encompasses a few different things. Um, one of them is running what we call our business rules model, which is uh, the risk filters, which we look at uh, um, over the, the taxpayer population to identify uh, what could be possible indicators of, of risk and some of the tests which we use um, to try to identify you know, variances or spikes and the example that Andrew gave before you know, where uh, we're just a transposition error where we're an extra zero on the end of a figure can um, identify those but more than that we've got our um, you know, compliance uh, aspects where we look at the candidate pools and select cases. Um, obviously our risk treatment strategy in the compliance areas has altered a little bit over the last three years. Some of you may have been um, affected by it where we've made greater use of assurance you know, type products with the, the risk and governance workshops which we've been doing and also in um, assurance um, correspondence and some uh, what we call field visits. Uh, but more than that the treatment strategy also includes um, guidance and support products and we've got our uh, governance and, and risk management guides, for one for the large business, one for the SME business and, and relatively recently we, we've uh, released one for the government sector. We've also got you know, fact sheets. Going back in time though, um, when the GST first was introduced, the integrity of business systems risk was actually called correct reporting. The name change occurred um, a considerable time ago and well before uh, my time and um, I believe the reasons being that the change of name to integrity of business systems, it recognises there are a number of elements in the correct reporting of GST. Part of that is your business systems. Part of it is also your best preparation procedures and processes and the application of effective controls. 
and of course having a well-trained you know, tax and accounting you know, function. Wrong way. Um, so today, uh, many of you may have been involved in the, the corporate tax management network sessions, um, which were conducted um, in June. Um, so what I'm going to do today is cover off some of the, you know, the, the slides which were uh, covered in there in respect to the client self-assurance model. Um, it, it, al it also has uh, so we're summarising what's happened, you know, back in those an announcements, but also. It, it does show some um, um, further thinking which we've done in respect to that. And I'll also talk about the GST integrity of business systems, risk manifestations and some examples of, of reporting errors. Uh, the, the shift in our approach. The ATO wants to change the compliance relationship with taxpayers by recognising willing participation in the tax system. Rather than seeking assurance about the integrity of business systems risk, we will be moving to develop relationship with taxpayers where we rely on your assurance that you have made an adequate investment in your business systems and processes to correctly report your GST and other BAS obligations and just as importantly your entitlements. We want to find ways to encourage taxpayers into a self-assurance relationship through the use of natural business systems and assurance practices through verification testing methods that meet our ATO assurance standards. Self-assurance requires ongoing commitment by businesses to use assurance methods and tools to validate their transactional systems, review the output of risk tests and rectify procedural weaknesses and address any issues that may affect the correct reporting of their GST and FTC obligations and entitlements. We recognise that for a, a large business to um, want to adopt a, the self-assurance um, model that we need to provide incentives and the ATO proposes to recognise taxpayers that engage in a self-assurance approach and de demonstrate that they are willing participants in the tax system. Potential incentives, and these are under early consideration, are for taxpayers to apply a self-assurance approach may include being placed in a lower risk classification and not being subject to a GST integrity of business systems risk compliance activity for a specified period. We believe there are also added benefits for boards and management teams, including more rigorous financial controls, the significance of transactional errors on GST throughputs and greater confidence all income sources are, are recorded, prevent duplication of purchases and payments and possible detection of internal fraud or other irregularities. We recognise that we need to um, conduct some re reality testing as to what could be uh, uh, form the self-assurance approach. So in collaboration with stakeholders, the ATO proposes to draft a framework for self-assurance, which may include a checklist of the assurance criteria and standards. The ATO will initially focus the development of the self-assurance model with large public companies. The ATO predicts that internal in and external stakeholder engagement and consultation will be conducted in the first half of the 2014-15 financial year on the development of the self-assurance model for large public companies. The ATO ex expects to extend consultation and co-design of the self-assurance approach and standards to inter interested taxpayers across other market segments in the longer term. Now, what could possibly be part of the uh, the proposed self-assurance framework. So possible elements of a self-assurance framework could include recognition that the ERP system and or accounting system reports all aspects of the business. The systems and or software used by the taxpayer maps to source systems in a manner that meets ATO requirements and standards, including verification testing of the integrity of the data in the preparation of each BAS. The systems and or software is kept up to date and any change to either the business, systems and or software are incorporated. The taxpayer to notify the ATO of any significant change in circumstances. The taxpayer to make voluntary disclosures as soon as errors are identified. And the appropriately authorised officer, we're suggesting perhaps the CFO, 
could provide an undertaking that their systems and or software meets the standards set out in the self-assurance framework. The use of assurance software tools is not a mandatory requirement for engagement in the self-assurance model. It is acknowledged that many large taxpayers may already have in place ERP systems and assurance processes to ensure the accuracy of the reporting of their GST and other VAS obligations and entitlements. However, we do believe that many taxpayers' VAS preparation processes and related controls may be enhanced with the use of verification testing, either built into ERP systems or the use of assurance software, particularly in the de detection of errors prior to VAS lodgement. The ATO is considering the release of, of its IBS business rules filters, which is the test which I was talking about before, which we use in our case selection, and also our e-audit test, which is the e-audit, we used to be called our computer assisted verification, uh, the CAV, to software developers with an aim that it will enhance error detection capability in commercially available accounting software. And with that, we're hoping that we may be able to address more than just the, the large market. Um, if we release the, our risk filters you know, to um, software developers you know, like your MyOBS and Zeros, that you know, we might be able to enhance their error detection capability in, in those software, which is used by many small businesses. Getting a, a little bit more onto what, what we're seeing in respect of the in integrity of business systems risk, the majority, almost 80% of ATO adjustments relate right into the integrity of business systems risk uh, were made as voluntary disclosures. In 2013-14, IBS, sorry, integrity of business systems voluntary disclosures adjustments by market segments. Uh, hopefully you can see on the, the pie chart there, but the large sector was over 51% of all those um, voluntary disclosures. And it should be noted that there is a high level of voluntary compliance as most errors were of an inadvertent nature and some of these errors may have been detected prior to BAS lodgement for the use of additional verification testing. So look, most of these errors probably have been picked up by you know, internal or potential reviews conducted by the business. Um, we obviously encourage that those sort of reviews are done on a periodic you know, basis, so, you know, at least annually. Um, but as Mark and Andrew mentioned before, the longer you take to detect an error, the consequences can be uh, greater. Look, the, the main GST integrity of business systems risk manifestations are, you know, do follow what um, Andrew uh, presented before, that uh, activity statement preparation errors were 39%. This is for large market adjustments last year. Systems related issues were 19% and unsure of supply status was 14%. In the small to medium enterprise market, the, the activity statement preparation error, errors were even more stark, 51% of all the errors. Um, they had trouble with recognising and correctly uh, reporting one-off asset supplies with 24% and technical understanding and interpretation was 9%. Some of the examples I'm provide are, are very similar to some of the ones that Andrew has seen, but, but we often see errors from manual intervention points, including manual journal entries that may have been prevented through system verification testing. An example, um, Company X issued an in invoice in March 2013 to Company Y for the sale of part of its business for 88 million, including GST of 8 million. Company X issued a manual invoice which was not processed in the accounting system and therefore not included in the March 2013 BAS due to an oversight. So this talks about addresses where you know, um, GST impacted transactions need to be mapped into the your, um, ERP systems but also a breakdown in the, you know, the prep, uh, processing procedures. Another example, a taxpayer made an error in the transfer of a number of transactions between two systems. The clerical error occurred when manual entries had to be processed to clear the GST components. As a result, one entry was processed as an, an additional transaction instead of being posted against the GST output tax account in the general ledger, resulting in incorrectly reducing 
GST liability by 1.8 million. We also see, commonly see errors from systems integration and use of spreadsheets. A client identified errors on a number of uh, activity statements that were related to clerical data entries during the preparation of the activity statements when consolidating the amounts of the GST group member companies. The best preparation processes and procedures were not followed and resulted in an adjustment of 10 million. Similar type errors occur when accounting staff make inadvertent mistakes transposing data from spreadsheets onto the BAS. Tax coding errors are another common example. A client had incorrectly set up a new client's record in their SAP system as GST free. As a result of this, a number of invoices were sent by the client without charging GST on supplies. Because the process of issuing of invoices fully automated, the error was not detected by any internal assurance systems. A client failed to correctly set up a customer's record in its accounts. As a result, a GST code was not applied to the customer failing to apply GST to sales. Now I'm just uh, reverting back to the, the self-assurance approach. Um, James O'Hellor and my Deputy Commissioner has um, been very strong on you know, what's in it from the client perspective. and So uh, this is what we've come up with. Um, uh, we're looking forward to um, uh, consulting with uh, with you and uh, getting your feedback, but but we see it as an opportunity where the taxpayer reports once to the ATO in providing assurance that the business's governance and indirect tax risk management processes are effective. An authorised person, whether that's the CFO or some other senior uh, person within the the business, can provide the assurance that meets the ATO requirements and standards at a letter, at a lesser cost in a shorter time frame. A taxpayer's business dealings are transparent and the ATO recognises willing behaviour and participation in the tax system by adopting no-touch or low-touch interactions. The increased use of verification testing in ERP systems and assurance tools may assist in the detection of errors prior to BAS lodgement, resulting in considerable savings in getting it right the first time and obviously stopping all the reverse workflows of us looking at uh, our risk filters, creating cases, contacting you and undertaking costly um, compliance activity. So our, our next steps. The ATO proposes to draft a framework for self-assurance which may include a checklist of the assurance criteria and standards. The ATO will initially focus the development of the self-assurance model with large public companies. The ATO predicts that internal and external stakeholder engagement and consultation will be conducted in the first half of the 2014-15 financial year on the development of the self-assurance for large public, pu large public companies. The ATO is considering the release of the GST Integrity Business Systems Risk Filters and e-audit tests with software developers in the 2014 financial year and aiming that those tests could be built into accounting and or self-assurance systems. The ATO will be conducting, sorry, will be continuing to develop the ATO's e-audit capability so our auditors can use additional verification testing to interrogate the transactional accounts of taxpayers and the ATO will continue to use compliance effectiveness and the tax gap analysis to support the investment in compliance activities. Uh, Mark touched on the tax gap analysis we did have a number of slides which we included in the talk corporate tax management network sessions back in June, so some of you may already have those, but um, if anybody did want to get those slides, so, um, they can approach me afterwards and I can forward them to you. So that's um, all I was intending to cover. Uh, questions from the floor, but just before, so whilst you're thinking of those, I've got a question from our online audience, Jared. If a corporation discovered a problem with its IT system in generating the figures for the BAS and subsequently amended the sales and purchases figures on prior BASs, if the numbers were significantly material, would this necessarily be a trigger for an audit? Well, not necessarily. Um, look, we've got our correcting GST mistakes. You know, we do have you know, time limits and um, dollar amounts, so, which may allow the, the taxpayer to do so. Uh, 
But if we're talking about a, a revision which is outside those you know, parameters, look, we would believe the best thing to do is you know, to contact the ATO, make what we call a, a voluntary disclosure. Uh, voluntary disclosures are treated concessionally you know, for penalties um, and, and also in respect of general interest charge and we believe that's the preferred way uh, to advise of those type of errors. Questions for Jerry. Uh, Jerry, you said the um, the ATO is considering the release of the the e questions to some software providers. Has the ATO considered releasing those to taxpayers, or will taxpayers have to engage those software to providers to get that those analytical tools? Look, that's a good question. You know, like. Uh, um, we would have to con consider that, but my own view, and uh, I need to discuss it obviously with my uh, uh, senior executive, but um, I would think if we did re release them, I couldn't see any reason why they couldn't be released um, more broadly. Um, obviously, some of the tests, you know, for some of the other risks, you know, in respect of refund integrity, for instance, um, you know, there may be some limitations on what we may wish to do. Um, you would appreciate that uh, you know, um, those sort of tests do try to d detect um, fraudulent behaviour and um, so that would be treated you know, differently. But it's something which we could very well consider and um, I'll take that on board. Let me grab another question. So under the self-insurance approach, the, um, the sign-off that, the, say, the CFO would give, uh, on what sort of regularity is that sign-off given? Does that cover a certain period? or Look, uh, once again, we'd be looking to be discussing this as part of the co-design process. Um, look, our thinking would be something on an annual basis, but um, we're willing to, um, you know, to discuss that and um, consider what is you know, appropriate in a you know, commercial sense, but but we do see some synergies in the, the existing processes which um, CFOs need to do in respect of annual reporting. And if this could be part, you know, when we talk about natural business systems, if this could be part of the natural reporting cycle, um, you know, that's where we'd like to see it to go. Other questions from our live audience? I've received another question from the online audience, Jared, that says, by using an assurance approach, this will likely flag a lot of exceptions month in, month out, hopefully at a reducing rate if errors are fixed. Is there a downside in the eyes of the ATO to being a regular error reporter? If you're detecting lots of errors are you effect and performing effectively self-audit, is there a downside to regular disclosure? Look, if anything, Chris, um we're probably more interested in people who never make a mistake. You know, like, um, <laughs> look, uh, in my own view, well, look, they maybe they're using, they might be part of the 7%, Andrew, using the assurance software already, but um, sometimes I wonder whether they're doing any you know, review and reconciliation activities. Um, but I think what the message we're trying to deliver is through the use of you know, verification tools and processes, hopefully you detect those errors you know, prior to lodging your best in the first place. But look, uh, we do recognise, as I started off, you know, you do operate in you know, complex organisational structures, well many of you do, you know, where you've got a lot of manual intervention points, you've got integration, integration interface issues when you've got subsidiary and feeder systems into main systems and we recognise that all of those pose a risk. And uh, from time to time, you know, like when we do our, our risk assessment, you know, we're saying that the integrity of business system risk is endemic, so it's across all markets. And we believe that over time, it's inevitable that errors will occur. Um, so as I said before, look, we, we would expect errors to be made from time to time and probably would be more concerned with those that you know, don't disclose any errors at all. Terrific. Thanks, Jared. Right, time to move to the third part of our uh, presentation. Before we do that, 
I've just got a signal. We've got another question from the web. How do we make a voluntary disclosure? All right, well, look, uh, it's been a few years since I've been in compliance, but <laughs> look, uh, some of you at the very top end of the market you know, might have a client relationship manager, and um, it would be that person, it would be your port of call, um, so perhaps a phone call followed up by a, you know, a letter or an email might be all that requires. Then for the rest of the what we call the large market, we have what we call a, a large service team. Now, I'm sure they, they have an email address or some, some other point of contact, but for the life of me, Chris, I don't know what it is at the moment, but we have that large service team and they, they uh, support the remainder of the large market. The, so the 1,300-odd economic groups, well, roughly almost 1,200 of them don't have a client relationship manager, so it would be the large service team. But uh, I can take that on board and you know, provide the... Um, you know, the actual um, contact point you know, for voluntary disclosures. Thank you. And we encourage them to come in too. Okay, you're proving very popular. I have another yeah, one no. from the web audience. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone wants to tell you their errors or, uh, yeah, or how good. to go yeah. about telling you their errors. If errors are in the main accidental, then one could assume that the errors could be underpayment or overpayment of GST. The statistics shown, which refer to voluntary disclosure, do those stats include overpayments of GST? Those, no. Look, at, look. You're right. You know, sometimes errors would have both what we call debits and credits. So in those cases, the, the voluntary disclosure amount would be the, you know, the, the net amount. Um, some other forums I've actually brought along, you know, case studies where we have identified you know, um, credit entitlements which weren't taken up because uh, I think people are very surprised that the tax office actually does that and you know, actually tells somebody. But, but there have been instance, instances, and I, I mean, in my experience, a lot of the large public companies I've dealt with do take a conservative approach, and I'm aware of um, one instance where uh, a, a taxpayer was trying to integrate as part of their... Um, their business systems, what was previously a, a manual process, and run the two systems in parallel for a period of time, mm. and yet remitted the GST twice for both. You know, like so, look, simple errors like that occur. Fantastic. Okay, so we will move to our third part of the um, uh, day, and that is to for me to introduce Tony Katsagaragas from CCH, who's going to take us through the technology products and services that we can use to manage GST operational risk. Tony. Thanks, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, what we're proposing to do this afternoon is, is to take you through and, I guess, illustrate some of the things you can do using today's technology. Um, it's not going to be just a, a demonstration. What we want to do is actually just go through and highlight, I guess, the, the risk management aspects of it and the automation aspects of it. So what we'd like you to walk away with is, I guess, to really start thinking about some of the benefits that can be had by moving away from products like Excel and putting something a little bit more robust. Before we go into that, however, I do want to cover off on, on a couple of things which are useful to, to know, I guess, before you go in, and, and some key understanding. So... Why do we focus on compliance when ultimately, when we're talking about tax, the end game of the numbers, it's the numbers that go to the regulator, it's the numbers that go into your accounts, it's the numbers that go to management. So you want to be sure that you get those right. So ultimately, getting that right is quite important. The second piece, and we talked about that a little bit earlier, is, is technology the answer? I'd love to say yes, and often when we're talking to clients that People will say, Tony, so if I put this in place, will it answer all, our answer all our questions? The reality is technology is an enabler. It's a very important enabler, and in today's world, really, you can't do without it. But there's a bigger picture. There's, there's the processes that wrap around that enabler. It's your data integrity. It's the people that you use, how you use them, and how you work together. So always bear that in mind. So when you're looking at these, these projects, there is a bigger piece that hangs around the technology itself. So what happens when we actually go out and talk to, to clients about technology like this? One of, the, uh, one of the 
key responses, particularly in the area of GSTs, we're really happy with what we have. It works. It works fine. When you dig in a little bit, and when we've gone through client surveys on Afro, when you look at the EY survey, we find that over 80% of clients actually use Excel. And yet if you go on the web and just quickly Google integrity of Excel, you're going to find a whole number of reports that will tell you the error rate on spreadsheets are 90% plus. If you Google a little bit more, there's people that talk about the global financial crisis being caused by a mistake on a spreadsheet. So how, how good is that system, really? Um, when you dig in a little bit more and we start talking about the integrity checks, so we've been talking about the exception tests and the, the EY survey that talked about 54% of respondents saying we do have a level of exception tests. Only 7% said they had comprehensive exception tests. So over 90% actually don't have comprehensive exception tests. When we go out and talk to clients and we dig in a little bit, we've learned to dig in a little bit and ask the question, so okay, tell us about the exception tests that you do. Typically we'll find there's maybe one or two exception tests that they run, and often within those one or two, it's just random checks. When you actually start going through the discipline of exception testing, you're doing anything between 15 and 30 comprehensive exception tests across your entire client base. So even though people might be doing exception tests, um, it might not be enough. The, the third piece is even if you are using systems, systems do change. So what we will show you today is different to what we have, would have shown you six months ago, and it'll be different again in six months' time. So systems change, processes change, so it's good to stay on top of that. The next key understanding is, and it's, it's one of the, the comments we strike a lot, is people will look at a system or a process and they'll say, but we don't do it that way. Ultimately, that's the wrong question, because what's to say that you're doing it the right way in the first place? The right question is actually, what's best practice? What's the right way of doing it? And then evaluate what you do in that context. Just because a system doesn't do it the way you do it doesn't mean it's the, the wrong way. And ultimately, actually, these automation systems are not intended to do things the way you might do it. What they're intended to do is implement best practice. And then ultimately, tax compliance tended to be in the past an internal matter um, between within the organisation, maybe with the regulator, but now it's no longer just an internal matter. It's, we've got self-assurance, we've got the tax risk management differentiation framework. Um, it's no longer just a tax function, it goes up to the execs that we talked about, the CFO potentially signing off on the integrity of the systems and the processes. And that's a trend we're seeing um, across, across the board. Okay, some observations, I guess, from a, from a CCH perspective. One of the questions that comes up a fair bit, um, and certainly across the network events, well, why self-assurance? Uh, why, why are we... Why are we going down that path? If you stand back a little bit and look at the progress over the years, we went from a situation where we used to lodge tax returns and, and compliance reports with all the supporting documentation and there'd be roomfuls of people that would actually go through and tick off things. We moved then to the self-assessment system where actually you only lodged the, the forms to free up people to come out and do more audits with, with, with the promise that every, every three to four years somebody's going to knock on your door just to check and make sure everything's going okay. We then move to the tax risk differentiation framework where there is a, a passive assessment of the risk profile of clients and off the back of that there were implications in terms of the level of audit and checks that actually came through. Let's stop at that point before we move to self-assurance and move to the, the new world under Chris Jordan where he talks about the 2020 vision and digitisation and no returns. So how do, you, how do you get to a vision of high digitisation, no returns, less checking in, in an organisation which faces the same sort of pressures that we face um, in, in, in the private sector with shrinking workforce, um, you have to work smarter. So when you look at it in that context, self-assurance is actually a logical next step in terms of actually encouraging people to get it right to facilitate a, a more automated future. So the, the question that comes off the back of that often in the, in the network events is, okay, so is, is the regulator asking us to do your work? Um, reality is when you look at it, no, it's not, because all of the reasons that Gerard covered, um, there is a good, th th there's good imperatives to actually get it right internally because it also has implications to your shareholders, to your results. You ultimately do want to get that piece right. And without sort of going through those reasons, again, there's one other piece. And one of the things that we observe when we're going out to clients is Spreadsheets is still one of the primary tools that are used in the finance function. 
when we sit down with, with a client that's still using Excel, the conversation that starts off with, we've got these fantastic spreadsheets. They do all these things. We're really confident. You dig in a little bit and you say, so who looks after that? And it's typically it's one person. So what happens if that person leaves? And then you dig in and you say, really, do you really think that you've got a robust process having the backbone of your organisation sitting on spreadsheets? And people then turn around and say, well, actually, no. We know we have to change at some point in time. So there's an inertia there. There's a recognition of the risk around using spreadsheets, but there's an inertia to move on. And that inertia is we know what we know. But more commonly today, the conversation that says, are you busy, right, is very real. People are working long hours, so who's got the time to move? So the other benefit, and it's a hidden benefit maybe from initiatives like self-assurance, is actually maybe encouraging organisations to take that next step um, and acknowledge the reality that you cannot run a national or multinational organisation off the back of a spreadsheet. Spreadsheets aren't going to disappear. They'll always be there. But they can't be the backbone of what you do. Yep. Um, the role of spreadsheets, as I said, so they're not going to disappear. Um, in the context of self-assurance, remembering that the purpose of self-assurance is to assure the regulator that we're getting it right. How can you provide that assurance off the back of a process and a tool? with 90% plus error rates based on independent studies. We talked about the focus on the executive, so it's no longer just the tax function. When I started off in tax many years ago, tax was really the last piece in the chain. It was, it was the forgotten puppy at the end of the day. You'd never get funding, you'd never get any, any focus. Today, the consequences of getting it wrong is at the executive level. Um, so the downside, I guess, is there's a lot of focus on tax. The upside is that if you're looking for reasons and funding to do it better and to do it more efficiently because the focus is there, you're more likely to get, um, to get some attention on that. And then finally, when, when you look at what are your options um, when you're looking to, to meet the self-assurance the, the self assurance or requirements, your options are you can build something out in your ERP systems, you, you can acquire a solution like Integrator, you can build something in-house, or you can do something on spreadsheets. Let's discount the spreadsheets for the moment. Ultimately, in terms of ERP versus off-the-shelf versus in-house comes down to a function of your organisation, your the size of your organisation, the capabilities, and your ability to develop and maintain it. So it's a very different decision, say, for somebody like Chris working in a, an organisation like Westpac, which is massive, um, to maybe a smaller organisation. So we'd make a different decision, say, within CCH if we're making that decision, to maybe what Chris might do. So there's different things that come into play. Ultimately, from the tax office perspective, they're not going to prescribe what you do. Ultimately, it's, it's, it's the attributes that, um, that they'll be looking for. And then finally, before, um, before I hand over to, to James, um, I won't go through these in a lot of detail. We, recently, we had a, a workshop on the tax risk management framework. And I worked through, I guess, what are some of the key attributes you need to think about when you're looking at systems. Um, and this wasn't integrated focus, it was fairly generic. So when you're looking at any system, what are the sort of things that you're looking at from a, from a risk management and automation perspective? I'll go through these very, very quickly, but if you want to get uh, have a look at that in a little bit more depth, you'll notice at the bottom and on your handouts there's a, there's a YouTube um, URL. If you go in, you can actually see that in, in a bit more detail. I think it runs for about 25 minutes. I won't go through all of that now. Um, but some of the key attributes, the first one's the obvious one, fit for purpose. It needs to be able to do what you're wanting to do. So in the context of GST, you want it to do the exception test. You want it to produce your BAS numbers. The second one is minimise the number of systems. So Utopia is maybe a single system that does everything. We're not going to get to a single system, but ultimately what you want to do is rationalise and, and have a minimum number of systems. Why is that important? It's important in terms of just general logistics, your ability to leverage simple things like how do you manage your users and security. So imagine managing security over a large workforce on one system versus 10. What happens when one person leaves? How many times have people left and people have forgotten to take them off the system so they can continue to log in? I had a colleague who was able to log into his old workplace two years after he resigned. I've seen that again and again. So the, the, the fewer the systems, the, the, the more efficient it's going to be, the lower the risk. It also allows you to leverage simple things like user setup and, in our context, entity setup and mappings and, and so on. Leverage related processes and data. Um, so often when, when you dig in to our world, a lot of processes and, and processes are actually related. So if we go, say, in the income tax world, trial balance, 
feeds into your accounts, tax reporting, tax return, overs and unders, PAYG, tax returns, management reporting. It's actually one process. The number of organisations we talk to that actually have different teams that use entirely different tools and they don't even talk to each other. Um, in, in the context of what we're talking about today, um, GST, so we're focusing in on transactional data. So GST maybe is the reasonably sort of discrete tax, but if you start thinking about your, your transaction data, if you involve in excise, the, the process you do for exception testing in GST is not that different actually to the process you do for excise. Um, what we're finding with a lot of clients when we're going in and putting GST systems in place is just general data analytics, your ability to cut and dice that data and be able to evaluate, maybe the, get some insights into your own business. So we have clients, for example, that create specific tests on a specific vendor because they know that vendor always gets it wrong. Or they'll actually dig in and look at their vendor profile for a particular service or function to be able to make decisions as to how they cut and dice their own suppliers and vendors. Um, so they leverage those related processes. Maximise automation. You're never going to get to the point where it's totally hands off, but Utopia is you touch it once and then it permeates through the system. So the more automation you have, the, the better the result will be. It will be not only faster, but the chances of transposition are far lower. Minimise the reliance on spreadsheets. So we, we've talked about that a fair bit. Um, the ability to review, audit and trace data. Ultimately, if we look at GST, there's a small piece of paper with half a dozen numbers on it. So when you go back a year later, how do you know what makes up those numbers? So the ability to be able to trace through those numbers back to the source, the ability to be able to work out why you applied a particular treatment. If something's not in accordance with your normal rules, why is that the case? If you've, if, if you've taken a particular path, why have you done that? So your ability to, to, to trace through the reasoning for that final result becomes very important from a risk management perspective. Um, workflow, this is really at a management level to, to be able to track the whole process from, from start to finish to make sure things don't fall through the cracks. Security. Within an organisation, if you've got a single platform, lots of people accessing it, they have different abilities, um, different levels of authority. You need to be able to control what they can do, what they can see. Data an analysis, we talked about that, that's the analytics. Configuration versus customization. Um, customization suite, when you engage somebody and they come in and they build something for you, um, and it's exactly what you need. In year two, when you pay the bill, it's a little bit it stings a little bit because it's expensive. Year three, when you suddenly realise how much it costs to maintain the customization, you let it go, which means that your systems fall out of date. Configuration is actually the ability to take something off the shelf, adjust it a little bit, so it does what you need it to do, but you don't have that high cost of ongoing maintenance associated with customization. Cloud and vendor hosting versus deployed on site. So we had a bit of a discussion on that a little bit earlier. What we're seeing with our clients is a wholesale movement to hosting. And it's really, a, one part of it is, I guess, the frustration of being queued and waiting for the internal IT group. Sitting on the vendor side, the other side of the coin is, when, when we look at, at a hosted application where we're managing that, we have a team that does that all day, every day. So we know exactly what to do. When we're dealing with organisations that do it internally, they look at it maybe once every six months, it's a new team, often there's mistakes, so the, the actual implementation process, which might take three hours, could take many days before somebody actually figures out the right way to do it. And then ultimately, in-house versus vendor development, that's always on the cards for a lot of organisation. The question you need to ask yourself is, do we have the expertise to build and to maintain? So um, it's not just a question of building a tool, it's actually maintaining on an ongoing basis. Um, and that's why often, except for, for the very largest of organisations, it's better to buy something off the shelf where it's somebody's job to actually maintain that and keep that up to date versus actually doing it yourself. So that's going through all those attributes at, at a reasonably high level, but I'd encourage you to have a look at the YouTube video um, that goes through that in a little bit more detail. So without any further ado, I think you probably want to have a look more at, uh, more at what the technology can do for you. So I'll hand over to James Alexandrowitz. So James is one of the product specialists based up here at um, North Road, and he'll sort of take you through some of the things you can do. Thanks, James. Thanks, everyone. I know we've uh, maybe getting a bit fidgety, and I am now the last person standing between you and drinks and nibbles. Um, we had one question that I, I did want to go back to because I think it's important for Jared to, 
to answer, and it was uh, one from our online audience, and it was talking about the self-assurance model and the CFO sign-off. And it was, would there be any additional exposure for the CFO in providing regular sign-off? Would they be exposing themselves to additional personal liability? And what are the consequences of an incorrect sign-off? Look, there are, the self-assurance strategy at the moment, it's a concept. We need to go to co-design. What form the assurance will take will need to be a necessary process of that, as will who will provide the assurance. But look, it's certainly our intention that the assurance, whether it's provided by the CFO, he's doing it on behalf of the company and it's directly to the, the tax office, we're the two parties. There's no intention of any public disclosure. It's covered by the normal taxpayer confidentiality you know, rules. Um, and look, I wouldn't think you know, there'd be any you know, um, personal liability attributed to the, uh, the CFO. Um, but once again, that will need to be worked out in the co-design phase. Thank you. And very non-supportive of it. Uh, the closest I've seen to that is the UK model where I gather it is legislated that CFOs do make these sorts of statements but the only sanction is at a corporate level. Okay. So, and obviously an individual signing a document is going to think about his or her personal reputation both within the organisation and more generally if that is proven to be wildly wrong. So it's not something you'd do lightly irrespective of the sanctions, I'd imagine. I had one more question. In relation to the model reporting, we presume that there is a mechanism to save down on the server or CCH's server the model database for the month. But when we do our BAS, we have potentially hundreds of emails between BAS repairers and reviewers' corporate fund account. I think you're talking about the additional information that you might have. So how do we lock down these other documents in the database? Probably you'd review your process. So James covered off on, on the review questions and the checklist and the questionnaire. Um, you'd probably try and encapsulate as much as you can within the system. And the systems do provide the opportunity to actually have that audit trail and that, that review process. So when, when you think about that right-click review question, um, you would look to use that internally. You'd be looking to use that if you're working with your tax advisor as well. Um, remembering it's an online system, so you're working in a collaborative environment. Um, so you'd probably reassess the use of email, and it sort of comes back to that comment that says, um, you know, look at best practice rather than what you're looking at the, doing at the moment. So right now it's Excel and email, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Terrific. Thanks, Tony. Are there any questions from the floor? Okay, um, if you just indulge me one minute, I'll just close, close out with a few comments. Um, we've covered a lot of territory today, so Mark and Andrew took us through the, the if you like, some of the history um, and their, um, their assessment of what the future holds. Um, certainly the information that Jared's provided us uh, gives us uh, an insight into the tax office and as I've called it, the tilt towards self-assurance. Um, and uh, Tony, uh, and the CCH team uh, gave us a good demonstration about those tools that are potentially going to be out there uh, for us to use. Um, I guess when I sit in the audience, as opposed to a chairman, and I take this information in, the struggle that, that we all have is how do we raise GST risk management? How do we lift it from being our issue to being an issue that people who are decision makers? Um, in my experience, everyone wants to deliver a better outcome. Uh, so what I want to do is two things stick out to me in the years that I've been dealing with operational risk. Uh, the w first is the barriers to change and the second is the gate openers to change. So the barriers, we all know. Business ownership, priority. Whose issue is GST? Cost, and Mark referred to it earlier, congested IT agenda. Just getting a change in sometimes takes you ages. So they're always going to be there. It's important to be aware of those because once you're aware of them, they're not going away. They'll be there. But what's more important is over the years, what 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 are the gate openers that allow you to look at these solutions? The first one I'd say is, have you got a proper tax risk management framework? 
is tax being discussed at the business level at senior management? Because it's only if it is, if you have one of those frameworks where it is an issue for everyone, you can have these conversations with those managers. At the day-to-day -day level, are you a sign-off or a stakeholder when systems are being changed uh, or processes are changing? Because that's where you can really have an influence. Business process improvement culture. Who doesn't have a business who's looking at improving themselves every single day? Are you part of that conversation? You should be, and tax should be there. Um, mandate automation for anything that's new. Zero tolerance to manual processes. Um, we do it. Anything that's coming in new, don't talk to me about getting someone in to do a manual process. So if you could be that harsh and do zero tolerance, great for you, but you should at least try and mandate automation as, a, as, a, as an objective. And the other one I, I put under the heading of business leadership. If you're talking to the business or trying to change a system that's not a GL per se, it's a business system, talk to the business about using their language. Give it a customer or a supplier um, uh, angle or lens. Talk to them about tax invoices that go out wrong and cause our customer systems to be... Uh, uh, to, to have errors in them, etc. Or push your suppliers to give you better information. So if you talk the business language and lead the conversation that way, you sometimes get better outcomes. Look, you've been a great audience. Thank you to everyone who's participated, um, the guys on the, uh, on the web, and we look forward to seeing you again at the next CCH seminar. Thanks very much.